due to the coronavirus crisis, we had to go virtual. Uh, he's an assistant professor in Yale School of Medicine, Department of Psychiatry. Uh, he's also affiliated with Department of Neuroscience and Physics. Uh, his background was in physics and mathematics. Uh, and then for his PhD, he drifted toward neuroscience and uh, he did his PhD work with uh, Xiao Jing Wang in Yale. Uh, and I guess he moved with him to NYU for doing a short postdoc. And then he uh, came back to Yale and started his own independent group there. Um, the focus of his group is on computational neuroscience and computational psychiatry. In particular, they are developing biophysical models in different scales and different complexity, both for healthy and dysfunctional brain dynamics. Uh, his group also is active in developing novel tools for uh, neural data analysis. Um, I think he is going to tell us about his recent DynaF research. Um, and I'm very excited to know more about it. And I guess uh, you guys also the same. Uh, so I don't want to keep you waiting further, and I would like to welcome him to our virtual stage uh, on behalf of everyone. Uh, John, please. Great. Thank, thank you for the introduction, Shervan. And um, obviously, I'm disappointed that I'm not able to visit Tübingen, but I'm happy that I'm able to speak to you virtually about uh, one of our new projects. And so the work I'm going to talk to you about today, the title is Geometry of Neural Computation Unifies Working Memory and Planning. And this is really the work uh, of a talented and very creative PhD student in my lab, Daniel Ehrlich. Um, and so the, the, the talk today is, is going to kind of focus on the, the topic of working memory and asking questions about um, less about the form of working memory in which I've done prior work and is a, a very hot topic and controversial topic in computational neuroscience about whether working memory activity is subserved through different uh, circuit mechanisms and population coding. And today I'm gonna to talk about, instead kind of the contents of working memory. Okay, so I'm gonna start with, a, go, go back to an old quote for the sake of being scholarly. And so this is a, a quote from, from HEB, the Organization of Behavior in 1949. And, uh, and the quote is, the extent that anatomical and physiological observations establish the possibility of reverberatory after effects of a sensory event, it is established that such a process would be the physiological basis of a transient memory of the stimulus. There may then be a memory trace that is wholly a function of the pattern of neural activity independent of structural change. And so this um, description of uh, a, a transient memory of a sensory event being held in a pattern of activity uh, is actually captures the essence of the way that um, many experimental and theoretical groups have thought about and modeled and studied um, working memory as, as a concept in systems neuroscience. Um, and again, that's the idea is that there's some kind of input to a circuit and through the activity in whatever form, it's able to preserve some trace of that for a later time in order to subserve later behavior. Um, and so I wanna briefly kind of touch upon some classic studies that have tried to look at what these contents of working memory activity are. Um, one very kind of influential paradigm has been the memory guided saccade task, um, really pioneered in uh, Pat Golden Rukish's lab at Yale. And in this task, um, monkeys were shown a visual cue that they needed to remember across a mnemonic delay in which they then had to make a saccadic eye movement toward. And when they recorded neurons in dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, they found neurons which were excited uh, by the cue, as you would expect from a sensory stimulus, but then continue to show the sustained um, delay, persistent activity throughout the delay until the time of the response. And this was tuned for the cue location. Um, and so there, this kind of established this idea of um, tuned sensory-like representations, which could be persistently maintained across a working memory delay to guide future behavior. And this was uh, essentially the, the framework which influenced a lot of the development of theoretical circuit models of working memory functions, such as um, attractor circuits in which neurons have some sensory tuning and have strong local recurrent excitatory inhibitory connectivity, such that when a stimulus excites um, a subset of those, they can continue to maintain the rep that representation of the stimulus across the delay through their internal reverberation in the form of persistent activity. And again, there's been a lot of um, work both theoretically and experimentally um, going after this question about persistent activity and instead whether it may be subserved by other mechanisms, be they um, synaptic, oscillatory, et cetera. Um, but nonetheless, there's this idea of um, persistent maintenance of a sensory representation. 
Now, there, you know, even since these early studies, there were some questions about what really is kind of being maintained, right? So in the memory guided saccade task, you could ask the question, is what's being held in memory um, a sensory representation of where the visual cue was, or instead a motor representation of where the uh, subsequent eye movement will be? And so a lot of uh, primate electrophysiology work has been done to try to tease apart uh, these different possibilities. And so, for example, here's one study um, from Bar Barash's group um, in which they used a memory guided uh, pro saccade as before, but also interleaved with that was a memory guided anti saccade in which the subject was required to make an eye movement in the opposite direction of the, of the target, the sensory cue. And so this was, would allow you to then tease apart by looking at the neuronal activity in the delay period, whether it tracks where the cue appeared or instead where the subsequent eye movement would be. And here they recorded in, in uh, lateral interparietal area, area LIP, and they found um, some neurons which did in fact reflect a sensory representation. So it tracked, uh, it had a higher activity that was persistent across the delay when the uh, visual cue appeared in its response field, um, but not necessarily when the saccade did. And then they have found other neurons which seem to reflect a motor representation um, and had elevated activity during the delay when there was an eye movement to that response field, but not necessarily when uh, the stimulus appeared there. And so this kind of set up this dichotomy that um, working memory representations are not, may not be purely sensory in nature, but could also be motor um, in a context in which a motor response can be planned in advance. But the thing is that in, in otherwise it would maybe default to a sensory representation. Um, and so uh, further work uh, by Earl Miller's group um, looked at this in the context of whether sensory representations may be kind of locked to a sensory uh, representation or maybe more flexible and goal oriented in what they described as perspective. And so here they train monkeys on a combination of a paired associate task in which um, the sample identity had to be uh, maintained across the delay in order to guide the appropriate response with its matching test stimulus or, and that's the player associate task, the ma delayed match the sample task is to respond whether it was a match or non-match to the sample. And here they did a, a, a clever uh, variant where they manipulated the visual properties of the cues to either make them more similar to other cues or to the um, other targets. And so then they, they were then in that way able to tease apart whether the neural activity um, looked more sensory-like or looked, in other words, was uh, more, had more similar activity if the stimuli were similar beforehand or instead what, were what they call perspective, which in which case neural activity would be more similar um, for similar looking test items. In that case, you would think that the uh, working memory activity is reflecting not what you saw, but what you are looking for in the test. And so when they recorded, again, in dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, they found that uh, neurons had interesting dynamics in that during the sample period, they primarily looked sensory related, reflecting similarity of the uh, sample stimuli. But then during the delay, a fraction of cells uh, became more prospective and started reflecting similarity of the target that was being looked for. And so this suggests that the contents of working memory can kind of flexibly evolve um, in a more prospective goal-oriented way. And another study from Earl Miller's group um, by Wallace uh, looked at rule representation. So here they trained the monkeys to perform either a match rule or a non-match rule, which was cued in different ways. And they found neurons again in DLPFC, which uh, tended to have higher activity or selective activity, uh, whether the um, rule to be applied was either match or non-match, regardless of how it was cued. And so this suggests that working memory activity um, can reflect kind of abstract quantities and in particular rules, which can be thought of as, um, as, as kind of contingencies uh, guiding how the response should depend on future stimuli. So all of these studies that I very briefly went over show that working memory activity um, contents, the representations can be inspected in different paradigms. And there are different kinds of dichotomies which are, are, have kind of driven debates in the field in terms of whether representations are sensory versus motor, uh, sensory versus perspective, or sensory versus abstract in some way.
And so this is the type of um, question that I'm going to dive into now um, and trying to come up with kind of a unifying um, framework for that. First, I'm going to go back to another um, old quote. And so this book, Plans in the Structure of Behavior, 1960, uh, is actually the book that coined the term working memory. And so we can look at a quote here. Uh, when we have decided to execute some particular plan is probably put into some special state or place where it can be remembered while it is being executed. Therefore, we should like to speak of the memory we use for the execution of our plans as a kind of quick access working memory. And so this is very interesting because this book was about um, the concepts of planning and how we have temporally extended um, structured cognitive behavior. And um, it highlighted the need for some kind of internal storage of what a plan would be in order to execute that. And they further you know, posited that the frontal lobe may be a particular uh, place where working memory uh, for various plans is stored or perhaps regenerated. So uh, I wanna kind of harken back to this uh, original book that coined working memory and kind of ask the question, what would neural representations look like if working memory stores and updates plans in contrast to storing stimuli from the past, which one needs to use later? And how can we kind of um, operationalize that in a very kind of simple and tractable framework for us computationally? Okay, so the, the task in which we're gonna look at this, I'm gonna call uh, conditional delayed logic or CDL task. And um, this is simply going to be Boolean logical operations. You have two Qs, QA and QB, and various rules that can be applied to those, or and uh, memory being reflecting QA, report reflecting QB, XOR, et cetera. And the, uh, the way we're going to make this a working memory task is by inserting a delay uh, between QA and QB. So the rule is going to be presented uh, throughout the trial. QA will be presented transiently, um, and then after a delay, QB appears and the response needs to be based on um, the combination of rule QA and QB. And so the kind of sim simple you know, way that we would solve this um, you know, would be a sensory strategy, right? That all one needs to do is store the information of QA, which is just a single bit, was QA zero or QA one across the delay and then combine all of these cues and rules to form the response. So it's a one bit storage of QA it would be a sensory strategy here. Okay, and so what is the, the computational geometry of this in the stimulus space? So now we can think of uh, different representations, um, different combinations of QA and QB, which can each be zero or one. And then we need to guide our response um, as some function of those. And so we can read out what the response is from these QA, B pairs um, in terms of a separatrix, right? a, a, a readout line which separates what one response should be over another. And so, for example, if the rule is memory being reflect, report what QA was, then this could be your decision separatrix. Um, in contrast, if you're reporting what QB was, then that would be your separatrix. And we can also create them for OR and um, or the nonlinear XOR. And so the, the key thing is that for each of these rules, there's a corresponding um, separatrix in this space of A and B that would allow you to read out the response from this sensory representation of QA and QB. And again, the way that would tie into working memory is that the representation of QA would be stored and held in working memory in order to perform this computation. Okay, so that's one um, scenario. And now we're going to look here at alter an alternative. And the way we can um, kind of gain some insight into that is by looking at how the task evolves over time. And so here we have for or and and, um, QA appears and that can be zero or one, and therefore you have these kind of branching different scenarios. Um, and then there's a delay and then QB determines the response. And so there are a couple of phenomena that I would like to point out here. Um, one is what I'm gonna call task closure. And so what you can see here is that um, if the rule is or and QA is one, then the response is going to be one regardless of what QB is. So the response is determined only by QA and is therefore kind of closed. You don't need to see what QB is in order to prepare your response. And then the other concept I'm gonna call task collapse. And so this is when you have the same plan or contingency 
i.e. how you respond to QB, even for different rule A pairs. And so you can see here, um, if it's rule and then A is zero, you could say that your state in the delay is determined by what QA was, right? That's the sensory strategy of storing um, what A was. But you could also think about your current state going forward, right? Which is, um, could be defined as the plan or contingency of if B is zero, then my response should be zero. And if B equals one, my response should be one. An interesting thing here is that um, this actually collapses with a totally different condition of when the rule is and and QA is one. Same thing, right? When you're in this lower branch of and, when QB equals zero, you should report zero. When QB equals one, you should report one. And so this already sets up how we can dissociate a sensory from what I'm gonna call a contingency strategy, um, is that this upper branch of or and the lower branch of one have different QAs being zero or one, but they have the same forward looking contingency of how the response should depend on QB. And therefore that provides the basis for an alternative strategy and an alternative representation stored in working memory to perform the task. Okay, so what that would look like here is uh, if we go back to all of these different rules in this conditional delayed logic task, is that we can now define this contingency as a state being um, what the response should be if B equals zero and what the response should be if B equals one and define these four different contingencies from that and then um, go in and, and basically label all of these different states based on the rule and QA according to what their um, forward looking contingency is. And so then the proposal is that instead of the working memory representation being was QA equals zero or one, it's which of these contingency states am I in? And so the idea here is now, again, you would start um, looking at the flow through time, you would start with a given rule and then QA is going to map you onto one of these four contingency states. Um, and so for different rules, the Qs will map one onto different states. And then the key thing is that um, from that con contingency state, then when QB comes in, that maps onto the action, onto the response, right? And so if you're in the zero, zero contingency state, then you're mapped to response zero, regardless of what QB is. Similarly for the one, one contingency and uh, the zero, one and one, zero contingencies kind of, again, map onto the response in a corresponding way. And so the idea is that this contingency can form the bridge um, between before the delay and after in order to guide the response. So uh, let's go back to the computational geometry now with this representation and compare that to what we saw with all of the separatrices for each rule in the stimulus representation. And so now our four states are not the AB pair, but are instead the contingency state. And what we find is that the computational geometry of how one responds to QB is much simpler here. Instead of a different separatrix for each rule, you only need two. You have this vertical separatrix here for uh, which separates if B equals zero, and you have this horizontal separatrix here for the response if B equals one. And these two separatrices, which are determined by the QB, are sufficient to then give the correct behavior. And again, we can also think about uh, the fact that the zero, zero and the one, one contingency states are closed under uh, QB and therefore they're in these, um, this upper right and lower left quadrant, which are reflecting basically the same response regardless of uh, what QB was. And therefore we can think of each rule now as corresponding to a different mapping um, by QA into one of these four contingency states. So for the OR rule, QA a equals zero maps to the one, one contingency state, right? Because if, um, actually I have that reversed, I'm sorry. Uh, that should, these colors should be reversed. The A equals one maps to the one, one state, right? So if A equals one, you know your response to OR is, is one regardless. Um, but in contrast, if A equals um, zero, then one maps into the, then your state should be mapped into the zero one state. And again, I apologize, these are reversed. Um, okay, so this is the, the, the kind of trade-off, right? We have a bit more complex mapping 
from the QA into the contingencies, um, but we greatly simplify our complexity of how we then map into the response given QB. And I'll also note that in terms of a, a pure working memory problem, this is actually uh, somewhat harder, right? Instead of remembering a single bit of whether QA was zero or one, here you have to have two bits in order to know which of these four states you're in. So we've increased our working memory load and increased the complexity of our mapping into the, one of these four states by QA, but we've greatly simplified our readout um, when QB appears. Okay, so that's the, the kind of theoretical framework. Now let's see um, kind of what the consequences of that are in terms of behavior and in terms of computative neural activity, which we will address in the model, but for which we don't have data. So first what we did is we took a variant of this task and tested it in human subjects. And so we took, um, basically mapped it kind of directly on. There's you know the rule on the screen the whole time. QA appears transiently. There's a working memory delay of two seconds. And then when QB appears, you make the response. And so here we used a subset of only five rules, um, XOR, OR, and memory, which is report A, or an anti-report, which is report the opposite of B. And these kind of span the four contingency states in a balanced way. And the subjects were you know, doing a key press response in terms of zero or one for their responses. And they were instructed to respond as quickly and accurately as possible. Okay, so what we can look at here, and we again, we had 19 subjects, um, is the differential response times under the different rule and QA combinations. Um, and what we found was an interesting pattern, which is that uh, when the rule and QA led to what we called an open contingency, the response time was substantially uh, longer, a slower response compared to when the rule and QA combo led to a closed uh, contingency state in, 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 in which the response is determined irrespective of what QB is, right? So this kind of makes sense that um, when you can preform, you pre kind of uh, generate your response and pre-plan it and prepare it um, without having to wait to see what QB is, then your response times are shorter. Um, but the, the key thing here is if you look at the or and and conditions, is that this cannot be set up by a strategy of doing it ahead of time, right? That you can't say, well, this is a memory trial. Therefore, instead of using a sensory strategy, I can use a motor strategy. But if it's any other rule, I, I'm not guaranteed that I can use a motor strategy. And therefore, I'd have to default to a sensory strategy. So it somewhat goes beyond the kind of sensory versus motor dichotomy that had been talked about. Um, because when you start out with an or rule or an and rule, you don't know whether you'll be able to uh, pre-plan a response or not. You have to wait until you see QA. And so this reflects um, kind of an online pre-computation, um, which is continually being updated with each Q. And that's consistent with this contingency um, coding framework that we've presented and not really consistent with the kind of passive sensory storage of you need to store QA in order to then um, combine it with QB. You're always trying to kind of update and move along the tree if you can. And so we can look at this closure effect in or and and, and it was um, significant across the majority of subjects. And so it seems like it's a pretty consistent um, strategy that is employed in this task. Um, we can also start to look at this idea of, of collapse and for contingency more direct, directly, although it's hard because it's really kind of a neural prediction. Um, and what we did here is look at two different uh, permutation tests in which we uh, randomly assigned um, what the contingency state was to different trials, be it on a trial-wise level or shuffling the contingencies themselves, and then doing a regression analysis to see what amount of the uh, variance in response time could be explained by contingency above and beyond, um, say, closure. Um, and what we found is that a substantial number of our subjects um, did have explanatory power um, determined by contingency itself. And so this may reflect kind of idiosyncrasies on a subject to subject level in terms of how contingencies map onto response times. Um, but really in order to test uh, the contingency beyond closure, I think that we need neural data to test this. Okay, so 
now we wanted to ask questions about kind of neural circuit implementations, what implications are for neural activity and neural dynamics. And for this, we turned to a modeling approach of using uh, artificial neural networks, in particular recurrent neural networks, um, in which we have a network here of 200 neurons of kind of generic um, activity and, and connectivity, which is then trained to perform the task. And so here we have the rule and Q inputs into the network. Um, through the recurrence connectivity of the network, it has to um, store whatever it decides to in working memory and guide the response. And then we read out the response from the network. And so the key thing here is that we're not um, dictating to the network which strategy it should use. We're not saying we need to have persistent activity for rule A. We're not saying we need to have it for um, for contingency. We're merely saying that the network needs to perform the task. And then we are training it here with backdrop through time to um, in order to get a network solution which performs it. And now we're going to kind of inspect what the neural activity of the network is. Okay, so the first question is, does the network actually um, adopt this contingency-based strategy as opposed to a sensory strategy? And so what we can do, we can test that by looking for um, a subspace which explicitly um, contains this kind of contingency signal in this 200 dimensional space of neural activation in the, in the trained units. And so we can you know, basically set this up a kind of a regression problem to define the axes in terms of what the contingencies are and then project the neural activity into that space. And what we find is a nice uh, representation in this two dimensional linear subspace in which individual trials, which are dots here, uh, cluster according to which contingency um, they belonged in. And we can compare the amount of neural variance that's captured in this subspace compared to other random directions. And we find that it's um, highly preferential in the subspace. So there's a lot of neural activity being represented in this subspace compared to other dimensions of the network. And then we could also test whether um, the network is really kind of using activity in this these subspace by doing a perturbation analysis. So what we did here is take the activity of the network at late in the delay before QB comes in and then perturb it in some direction in this 200 dimensional state space and then see how that impacts the accuracy of the, of the response in the network. And we can do those perturbations either within the subspace or out of the subspace and then vary the magnitude, the strength of the perturbation. Um, and when we do that, what we find is that the accuracy drops much faster um, down toward 50% chance level when we do the perturbation uh, within the subspace compared to directions that are orthogonal to the subspace. And so this provides good evidence that the network is essentially using um, the activity of its state space that's within this contingency coding subspace in order to perform the task. Uh, we can also look at this, what I showed you before was a linear subspace method, supervised. What we could also do is just an unsupervised nonlinear dimensionality reduction. Here we used UMAP and looking at the late delay activity, we can ask how does the neural activity naturally kind of cluster in the network during the delay and whether that is primarily driven by, for example, uh, Q versus contingency and what we or, or rule. And what we find is that in late delay, the distance between points is much smaller if we um, look at that in terms of points with the same contingency versus rule. And so there's a natural clustering uh, as assessed here by UMAP in terms of contingency. If we then look earlier in time at the uh, early delay, what we instead find is that the activity is much more driven by the queue. And so therefore it takes time over the delay. There's this kind of dynamic transformation of uh, states being clustered by the queue to states being clustered by the contingency. And if we look even during the four period, we can see that states separate by the rule and there is some contingency information in there. And therefore the, the kind of picture that's emerging is one in which the network is kind of continually computing and updating its state, which then updates its uh, plan or how it will respond to future stimuli kind of dynamically throughout the trial as it accumulates more information. Okay, so now how do we map that onto the response? So let's go back to our kind of abstracted uh, view of things. And so we can imagine a contingency coding subspace. And then when uh, QB comes into the network, it's gonna perturb the network in some direction. 
right? The QB being zero or one are some fixed input weights into the network. Um, and therefore, when QB is zero, it's going to perturb the state of the network in a similar direction, regardless of where you are. And it's going to, if it B equals one, it's also going to perturb you in a different direction, maybe an opposite direction. And so the question is, given this um, response to QB, how can we map that on to the proper response from the contingency states? Mm -hmm. And so you can see here that just with a, a single separatrix here, um, you could actually read this out such that um, everything to the left side of the separatrix or the lower side maps onto Z equals zero and everything kind of inside here maps onto Z equals one. And so that would be one way to do things. Uh, what does the network do? And so we can look at the, uh, the early response when QB comes in, what is the initial direction in which activity changes within this uh, two-dimensional contingency subspace, again, which is embedded within the two-dimensional state space of neural activity. And we see something very similar that you get a, basically a similar direction of response for each of the four points. But then how does this eventually map onto the response? What we can do is in, we had this two-dimensional subspace here, which I'm showing in X and Y, um, but now we can also define a response axis, which is determined by the readout weights of how the response is read out from the network and now project the trajectories of the neural activity um, over time from when QB comes in. And so what we find is that even though the states are nicely defined within this two-dimensional subspace, they also actually separate along the response axis. Um, and what it ends up corresponding to is kind of a, a pre-planned response for the two closed conditions of zero, zero, and one, one. Um, and then what we find is when QB comes in, um, the closed conditions ultimately don't change within now this three-dimensional subspace very much, but the uh, two open conditions of zero, one, and one, zero are then driven and follow a trajectory in the state space to end up near the corresponding um, response. And so now we can kind of think not only about how we're able to map into the contingency subspace and represent this information, but also how the response to the subsequent stimulus is enabled to guide the neural activity um, to the appropriate state that it needs for the response. Okay, so now that we've kind of established how the network works at this kind of uh, population dynamical level, uh, we wanted to kind of zoom in a bit more on the representations and compare that to uh, prior findings in the field. So here's one example neuron um, in the OR rule and separate between whether QA is zero or one. And we're looking at the delay activity. And so if you only had this, this neuron recorded during the OR rule, um, you might be tempted to think that this is representing the sensory stimulus of whether QA was zero or one. And this is again, how most uh, electrophysiological data from behaving animals is, is performed with a single rule. And therefore you can't really um, disprove that it's not a sensory strategy in this case. But if we now look at this neuron across all the different rules, what you can find is a much more complex pattern, right? That in other rules, instead of having a preference for QA of zero, it has a preference for QA of one. And in other rules, it has no preference right at all. It has no persistent activity that is selective. Um, and so, you know, this is consistent with kind of emerging pictures of um, neural activity in prefrontal cortex reflecting kind of mixed selectivity. So in this case, you could say that this neuron does not have pure selectivity for rule or pure selectivity for QA, but instead you get nonlinear interactions um, between the two. And there are, I think, a lot of debates in the field right now on the degree to which this uh, nonlinear mixed selectivity is structured or unstructured. And indeed for this neuron, instead of it being kind of random combinations of rule and QA, what we can find is actually that this neuron is well explained as selectively coding the zero one contingency. And therefore there is kind of structure to the, the representation here. Okay, so now I wanna look at the, the time course of this contingency representation. So we can look at how much variance is explained in the neural activity um, as a function of time over the network. And so you can see that, you know, uh, encoding of rule rises early and is maintained. Um, variance explained by the Q rises rapidly during this period of uh, Q presentation 
and then slowly decays over the course of the delay. Um, and in contrast, the contingency um, representation, how much variance in neural activity can be explained by contingency, uh, gradually grows, um, is very low during the Q period, but then grows to be dominant actually by late delay. And so kind of what are the consequences and how does this relate to prior observations in the field? Um, so one consequence is that if you're only looking at a single rule, but looking at how the sensory stimulus is represented, right? So what is the, the coding axis between zero and one, for example, uh, within a single rule, it looks very dynamic in the sense that um, the angle between those co that coding axis at one time point and another time point that separates the two different stimulus conditions um, changes dramatically from specifically from the queue into the delay and across the delay from early to late. And um, this is consistent with a number of observations of kind of dynamic coding for working memory in the field. And this can also be observed with a decoding analysis. So we can show that we can read out the, the, the queue at every time point. Um, but if we train our decoder during the queue epoch, well, during the, the queue presentation, what we find is that it doesn't generalize to the delay, indicating a transformation of the representation as we go from the uh, queue, the Q presentation early delay into delay delay. And this is reflecting what we had in the network of this transformation from Q encoding to contingency encoding. And therefore, you know, what we would then propose is that some degree of the dynamic coding that is um, a very um, important topic of interest in working memory may actually be reflecting a transformation from a more sensory representation into a more abstract, forward-looking planning contingency-related representation. Um, we can also, again, kind of see that in, in the prior literature, and I'll again go back to the study from Earl Miller's lab um, by Rayner, where they were looking at sensory versus prospective coding, and there they were kind of viewing it as, in terms of this visual domain of what is the similarity of this visual stimulus you saw versus the visual stimulus you're looking for, but they saw this transformation um, where, whereas during the sample period, um, neurons are primarily reflecting um, sensory information rather than prospective, but then during the delay, um, the sensory dropped and the prospective um, increased in terms of the tomb cells. And a similar pattern is observed in our network when we're looking at now the explained variance in the network, where we get this kind of transformation from a sensory to a contingency code. And so we think that that's consistent with this observation. Okay, um, let's see. We can also look at how contingency actually shapes the tuning for other variables which are commonly studied. In this case, looking at tuning for Q and rule. Uh, I just wanna kind of walk through this as an example. So here we can, for example, now take two rules, right? So what I showed you before was looking at a single rule, um, but now we can, for example, consider the memory rule and the XOR rule as a task pair. Um, and look at, again, the four different representations uh, in this contingency state. And now ask, um, what is the average Q tuning tu tu during the delay? Which means average over the uh, different rules. And now look at how much the, the are separated by the Q identity. Um, or instead, look at rule tuning, where you take the average um, across the different rules and see, sorry, across the different QAs and see how much separation there is in terms of the rule tuning. And in this case, um, if we only had this two-dimensional contingency representation, what that would predict is that you have um, a high amount of tuning for the sensory Q, but a very low amount of tuning um, for, the, uh, for the rule for that XOR memory pair. But if we look at other rule pairs, it actually can vary quite a lot. And so we can look at every single pair of uh, rules in our network and try to make this prediction about um, on this purely theoretical grounds of how much sensory versus rule tuning there should be for a given pair of rules. And we compare that to the simulation of our full network, we find that it does a decent job of explaining that. So kind of on theoretical grounds, contingency can explain the degree to which we observe Q tuning or rule tuning here in a given pair of tasks. 
Okay, so uh, now what I want to do is uh, kind of compare this trained RNN to other coding schemes. And this ultimately will then make predictions for future tests in neural activity. And so uh, on one extreme, we could have pure selectivity, which is just a pure representation of the rule QA, QB. And this may be simply stored in um, uh, an isolated or linearly mixed uh, representation in the network. And at the kind of other end of the spectrum would be a very random um, nonlinear mixed selectivity. And so for this, we used um, a theoretical model from Stefano Fuzzi's group, where they called randomly connected neurons or RCNs, in which, in which each neuron gets random input from, in this case, the rule and cues, and then uh, applies an, a threshold to get a nonlinear response. And therefore, you end up with a very high dimensional representation of basically all um, Q and rule interactions across your population of neurons. And so we can take these as kind of two extremes on a continuum of kind of ordered to disordered representations and see how our trained network, network relates to them. So one thing that we find is that the, is by looking at the dimensionality of the network activity across all the trials. Um, and well, the RCN, this randomly connected network, high dimensional nonlinear mixed selectivity as expected increases the dimensionality of the neural activity because you're getting all of these nonlinear interactions between rule and queue. In contrast, our RNN actually, uh, our trained network actually reduces the dimensionality um, because we're kind of collapsing onto this low dimensional representation of contingency. Um, we can also look at uh, perform what's kind of known as a representational similarity analysis so this is looking at the similarity of neural states, how correlated is the activity profile across neurons um, for different, uh, different combinations of, of rules and QA pairs. This is again, looking at the delay activity. And we can look at this comparing the, our trained network and the randomly connected network, the RCN model. Um, and then compare that uh, pattern of similarity of states to what a theoretical prediction would be if a network say we're only coding the queue, we're only coding the rule, or only coding the contingency. And look at now, look at the similarity of these uh, matrices from the simulated networks to these kind of theoretical bases. And what we find um, kind of consistent with, with what we thought is that the RNN has a much stronger um, coding of this contingency representation compared to the RCN. So the way to think about this is that the RCN um, encodes basically all nonlinear combinations of rule and Q, but the contingency is a very specific low dimensional interaction between rule and Q. And that's why the dimensionality is lower and that's why we get preferential um, representation and similarity um, that looks like a contingency. And we see a similar thing if we look at the amount of, again, variance explained by the network here comparing our trained network to the RCN as um, kind of a, a prototype model of extreme disordered high dimensional um, interaction coding. So uh, the idea is that this would be something that for example, could be tested in neural activity, whether it be from awake behaving animals or in uh, humans in say an fMRI experiment where these RSA type analyses are commonly done. And so the way that one we could test this kind of statistically uh, would be to take all of our trial conditions and again, shuffle the contingency labels across all of the rule and QA pairs to get kind of a pseudo contingency and then say how much variance is explained by contingency versus pseudo contingency. Um, and what we can then find compared to that null distribution is our RNN model has substantially more variance explained by contingency than the pseudo contingencies whereas um, the RCN model is within that distribution. So this again suggests that um, this would be a, a useful test that could be applied to neural data. And here we're using the RCN model as one which creates nonlinear mixed mix selectivity, but kind of an even distribution of nonlinear mixed selectivity, not necessarily of this low dimensional contingency variety. And that's what kind of our core prediction would be, is not that there is not coding for the Q or the rule, but that of the nonlinear mixed selectivity, it should be preferentially of this contingency variety. Okay, so just to close out, I wanna do a brief 
advertisement for a, a software package that my lab has developed, which is specifically for training these artificial recurrent neural network models on tasks. It's called PsychRNN. You can uh, already download it and get started with it. We'd love to get feedback. The preprint is coming soon. And we've really designed this to be um, a useful and user accessible framework for defining tasks in a flexible modular way, training them and analyzing them. And uh, we've kind of focused on a few different features such as modularity of defining the tasks and architectures, um, incorporating neurobiological constraints to explore those hypotheses, um, and also introducing uh, curriculum learning or shaping such that the way that we train the network can evolve as it learns and as its performance improves, which is also the way we train animals. And so I think that's a very understudied direction in this class of models and something that we wanted to prioritize. Okay, so I'm gonna wrap up now. So just to conclude, um, what I've kind of been talking about for the last 45 minutes has been a framework for thinking about working memory representations, which are based on contingencies, going back to this idea of plans um, playing a central role in kind of forward-looking, action-oriented, goal-oriented nature of, of working memory and prefrontal cortical function. Um, we ran a behavioral experiment which found evidence consistent with this idea of pre-planning and continually updating one's plans as stimulus, stimuli come in, in contrast to kind of a more passive sensory strategy of maintaining sensory information for computation only at the end of the trial. Um, we found that this contingency-based computational strategy emerges naturally in the trained networks um, without us kind of specifying it, which indicates that it's a natural solution. Uh, and we make testable predictions for behavioral and neural activity. And so some future directions kind of extending from this project that we're pursuing right now, one is uh, to really try to find experimental tests of these contingency representations and task collapse um, in contrast to a sensory representational strategy. Um, we're also very interested in theoretical analyses of this computational complexity and geometry and how these strategies may differentially scale with the complexity of tasks. Um, and then finally, we're also um, pursuing applications to computational psychiatry because many neuropsychiatric disorders are associated with working memory deficits, deficits of disordered thought, cognitive control, et cetera. And so we're interested in how this framework can inform uh, those questions. Okay, thank you for your attention. Thanks, John, uh, for your talk. Um, I thank you on behalf of everyone because we cannot have a physical collab. Uh, there are a bunch of questions. Um, I, I read them through. Um, and if someone pops out in the Zoom, I will also ask their question. Uh, I apologize in advance if I'm pronouncing the names in the wrong way. Um, Kamilio Lipdinsky asks, uh, did you see any network that solved the task using sensory strategies throughout the delay? Sounds like contingency planning is more reaction time efficient strategy since you are doing integration of sensory and rule information during the delay period. But for non-speed ta tasks, I imagine some people and neural networks may use the sensory memory strategy instead. Yeah, so that's a very interesting question. There are kind of two parts to that. Um, again, we instructed our, our subjects to respond as quickly as possible. And as Camilo suggested, you do get a benefit on a fraction of trials by being able to do the, doing this kind of pre-computing. And so in that experiment, we were trying to uh, kind of bias subjects toward using that strategy, if not giving it to them explicitly. Um, in the networks, um, what we found is that we can train the network to use the sensory strategy. So if on some fraction of trials, we only give the rule at the end at the same time as QB, it can learn to use a sensory strategy because on, then on those trials, all you have is QA to store. And so it is a viable strategy, both you know, uh, for organisms and for the trained networks. Um, but in the conditions we've looked at, it seems to be kind of a preferential solution. But that's one reason why we're very interested in looking at variants of the task where we can maybe change those trade-offs or the computational complexity and maybe push the networks and the humans um, to develop a theory for when should you use a sensory strategy, when should you use a contingency strategy. Um, and that's something we're very interested in, but I don't, I don't have any results for you yet. Thanks, uh, thanks John. And second question from Dean Renz. Uh, 
Uh, he asked attractor models of working memory suggest that holding a queue in working memory correspond to a neural activity remaining near a corresponding attracting state. How might continuous computation be represented in this framework? Would the attracting states uh, themselves move? Um, so if I'm understanding the question, it might be about going from uh, discrete representations to more continuous. So for example, you know, in, in a, in, in these attractor models of working memory, going from point attractors to a ring attractor to get a kind of a continuous angle. Um, that's something we haven't explored, but I imagine that things might perform similarly. But again, I think, again, going back to this idea of the computational complexity, one potential issue with this contingency strategy is the combinatorics of it might scale really badly, right? Because it's all of these interactions of QA and rule depending on the response to QB. Um, and we don't yet have a, a good theory for, um, for how these things scale. And going to the kind of continuous limit, as I think the question suggests, is, can maybe be thought of in that way. Uh, John, uh, the last question from YouTube channel, uh, YL asked, uh, he didn't indicate a proper name. Uh, can you say something about how the sensory queue is transformed into the contingency presentation and how this shapes the neural dynamics during the delay period? Yeah, so um, again, what we see is that, and actually this kind of goes back to, to Camilo's question also about like why the network learns the strategy, right? Is that the trained RNN the, you know, after it's trained, the input weights for QA and QB are fixed, right? And they don't, you know, they don't depend on the rule themselves. And therefore they're going to perturb the network in a similar way, a similar direction in state space, um, regardless of what the rule is. And therefore the only way that you can really do context dependent computation in those networks is by changing kind of where you are in state space, such that the same perturbation then puts you on a different trajectory to a different, uh, a different attractor state or region of state space where you need to go. And so we kind of see this evolving over time in the network where in the four period, when we only have the rule, things are separating by the rule, but we already get some kind of clustering. I, I kind of went over this very briefly, um, which includes contingency where similar rules in terms of similarity of contingency are kind of lumped together because they're going to then respond to QA in the same way bring you to the attractor states of contingency. And then QB comes in, it's gonna, you know, then you'll respond differently to, because of where you are. And so that's maybe another way to think about it where when I was showing the, um, all the separatrices um, for the sensory strategy, that is like different readout weights or, you know, but in the RNN, the readout weights are fixed, the QB inputs are fixed. And so um, that might promote a strategy of um, changing where you are in state space to respond differentially rather than having many flexible readouts. John, uh, there is another question from one of the audience. Uh, I don't know if he can uh, unmute himself or not. Uh, but if not, in the meanwhile, I can uh, ask uh, uh, other questions. Uh, Sebastian, can you unmute yourself and uh, ask your question? I'm not sure if, okay. No, Shervin, I think only the hosts can unmute themselves, not all the participants. I mean, I I, I press, uh, okay, never mind. Maybe he can uh, write this and I will ask on his behalf. Sorry for yeah. the inconvenience. I mean, uh, okay, uh, Peter asked, uh, what happens halfway through learning? Does the network go through a period in which sensory information is coded for longer? Yeah, that's a really, Interesting question. And that's something that we're actually still kind of pursuing right now, even in the context of human psychophysics. Um, what it seems is that the network kind of learns kind of simpler strategies and then adds on um, more nonlinearity. So it'll learn, for example, um, one rule or one contingency and then kind of add on more and kind of build upon that representation. Um, it's, it's something we're actively looking at. And I, I, don't, I don't have a very intelligent answer at this point, but it's a super interesting, important question. Uh, John, another question uh, from YouTube. Uh, can one say that contingency is one special case of predictive coding of future sensory slash action or rule states? 
Yeah, I mean, I think that there are some similarities there. Uh, maybe I, I, don't, I don't fully understand the where they may diverge, but it, it is about you know a, a predictive state of how one should respond to the future. And so, in that sense, um, it does have have this idea of of prediction into it. Although um, there's not, we don't manipulate uncertainty or anything in the task in order to kind of think more directly probe that. It's an interesting question actually to think about how um, uncertainty could be in, included in that. Yeah, I'm not sure. I haven't thought enough about that. Interesting question. Uh, so I guess uh, we are done with all the questions. Uh, uh, I, 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 I guess Sebastian couldn't write his question or come online, but uh, I think he can ask it some other way. Yeah. Thanks again, John, uh, for your exciting talk. Uh, yeah, thanks everybody. And um, yeah, have a nice evening in Germany and morning, good morning, for, uh, John, in the US. <laughs> again, yes. I have on behalf of everyone else. On behalf of the Tubing Neuro Campus, thank you so much, John. It was a great talk, really interesting. I uh, appreciate yeah, thank it. Thank you for having me. Yeah. And hopefully we will see you soon in Tübingen. Yes, hopefully. <laughs> so thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.